Good morning. Today we're going to be moving on to the cardiovascular system. In this lecture piece will talk about blood flow dynamics, then I'll talk about the cardiac cycle, and then end with the electro electrocardiogram, ECG, electrocardiogram. First, let's talk about the general function of the cardiovascular system. So I know a lot of people think, oh, well, you have blood. Blood is for living, and that's as far as people think about it. But really, the reason you have the cardiovascular system is because it transports things around the body. So those are things like nutrients. All of the nutrients that are coming off of the digestive system, they need to get to the cells some way. And the way that they get to the cells is using the cardiovascular system. Things like gases, the oxygen, and the carbon dioxide, those all need to find their way from the respiratory system to the cells and then back to the respiratory system. So please note that all of these things right here, those are again all supporting the um, cellular respiration process. Then also things like hormones from the endocrine system, those are all going to be used, those are all going to be transported to the places that they need to go through the cardiovascular system. Now, Let's talk a little bit about body fluid homeostasis. Remember that body fluids, there's three compartments that have fluids in them. Um, you have the cells, remember cells are basically just sacks of water. And then you have the extracellular fluid and then you have the plasma in the blood. So you need to make sure that you have balance so that the fluid is moving through those three compartments. And if you don't have balance, you'll end up with a disorder that's called edema. Edema just means swelling due to fluid accumulating in one particular spot, right? So you need to make sure that you have balance between those different compartments. Okay, now let's get into the physics of blood flow, looking at what causes it to flow and what prevents it from flowing. Okay, so please note that flow means to move. Okay, so it's what we're looking at is the distance it travels over a particular amount of time. It's a rate, a speed. Okay, so there's two parts to look at it. What we're looking at here is what causes it to flow, and the thing that causes it to flow is pressure differences. Okay, so please note I didn't say just pressure, what we're talking about is differences in pressure. Okay, so that one side of the blood vessel has a bigger pressure than the other side, that difference in pressure is going to allow or can cause the, fl the blood to move through that, that vessel. Okay, so that, so that causes it to happen. Now it's going to be hindered or stopped by resistance. And resistance is things that get in the way, make it so that it won't flow as, as quickly and that's generally friction. So the amount of the friction that the blood has as it goes through the blood vessels. And so you can turn this into an equation here. And I don't, you don't need to memorize anything. Just note that things that are on top of the equation, those are going to help it flow, make it flow faster. So the driving force for blood flow is the change in pressure. And then resistance, things that are on the bottom of the equation, they're going, they're getting in the way. Okay, so those are going to have an inverse or an opposite relationship with blood flow. Okay, let's look at, um, let's look at changes in pressure more closely. So here we have the heart. Oops, give away the answer. So here we have the heart right here, and the heart is what's caught, when it contracts, that's what creates the pressure gradient in the first place. In this heart, we have the four chambers, and we have the right ventricle, which pumps to the heart, to the lungs, and then the left ventricle, which would pump to the whole body. So when that left ventricle contracts, that creates pressure, and that pressure will then cause the blood to flow into the arteries. And as the blood is flowing from the arteries into the arterioles, to the capillaries, to the venules, back to the veins, then returning to the heart, it's going to lose pressure as it goes through that circuit. So that means that there is more pressure on one side of the circuit than there is on the other side of the circuit. And that's what creates the 
pressure gradient that will drive the blood to flow through the, to, through the blood vessels. Okay, so when you're looking at it again, it's not just pressure, it's the change in pressure. So let's look at a simplified version here. So if you have a pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury, that's what, this is what that means, that's just the unit of pressure, 100 millimeters of mercury on one side, and as you go through, you end up with zero millimeters of mercury on the other side, what would be the pressure gradient? The pressure change. Well, 100 minus zero is 100. Okay, so that, that pressure change is what causes it to flow through the blood vessels. Okay, let's look at resistance, not wanting to go, okay, getting in the way. So there are three factors that affect resistance. We have the radius. The radius refers to how far across it is. So diameter would be the full length across. Radius is half of that. But basically, you're just looking at it, how fat the blood vessel is. Whereas the length, that would be how long it is. Okay, so if you look at this would be the radius. Here's the length now. And then viscosity, viscosity has, is a property of the liquid, the fluid, in this case, blood traveling through the blood vessel. Okay, that's thickness of the blood. Okay, so you can create an equation here and do not memorize this equation. I never ask you to memorize equations. I just put them on there because some people are a little mathematical and it makes more sense to them when they see it in this format. So basically, I just want you to understand that variables that are on top of the equation, those are going to be proportional or sometimes exponential relationships with the flow. So an increase in any of these variables means an increase in flow. And variables that are on the bottom, the denominator, those will have an inverse relationship so that an increase in any of these variables would have a decrease in blood flow, okay? So the, your primary focus for this part of the lecture is to focus on the relationship between these different variables and blood flow rate. Let's start with radius, okay? So remember that's how thick it is. So let's look at an example, just a simplified example first. So if we have our blood flow here, our blood, our blood radius is one millimeter, and if we take that blood vessel and we make it so that the radius across is now two millimeters, what we see is not only do we see an increase in flow, so if F is our baseline flow, what we don't just see a double in F, not twice as big, but actually four times bigger. And that has to do with the amount of the blood that's in contact with the blood vessel wall. And so what you're looking at here is more, as you make the whole blood vessel bigger, less of the blood would be against the wall, which means you would have a dramatic decrease in the amount of overall friction. Less friction, less resistance, increase in flow. Okay, so it's an exaggerated, a big, an exponential increase in blood flow. Okay, now let's look at how you would change the radius of a blood vessel in the body because this is always this is constantly changing from moment to moment in order to adjust blood flow so if you are trying to make the blood vessel smaller the way that you do that is you take the smooth muscle which is part of the blood vessel wall and all you have to do is contract it and when you contract the smooth muscle that's going to do what's called vasoconstriction vasoconstriction, make the blood vessel constrict, make it smaller, and that will decrease the diameter or decrease the radius, which would then decrease the blood flow rate. And then to, to dilate it, all you have to do is um, cause that smooth muscle to relax, and when the smooth muscle relaxes, that will do vasodilation, bigger radius, uh, faster flow. Okay, so this is happening all the time through your body to adjust which areas of the body get more, which areas get less, and it helps it, uh, regulate blood flow throughout the whole body. It also helps regulate uh, blood pressure too, as we'll see later in next, next week. 
Okay. At this point, I want to introduce the idea of amphosclerosis. Amphosclerosis just means narrowing of the arteries, and this happens due to plaque buildup. So remember, we talked about diets that are high in saturated fatty acids. They tend to create a lot of low-density lipoproteins with a lot of cholesterol in them, bad cholesterol. You may have heard that term. And because of how sticky they are, they tend to stick to artery walls. And when they stick to artery walls, sometimes they can even recruit blood clots, which are called thrombus. So thrombus is just a blood clot. And so the net result here is that you have a much, much smaller area for the blood to be. So essentially what you've done is you've decreased the radius. And when you decrease the radius, what happens to blood flow? Decrease in radius, decrease in blood flow. So down, down. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to mention, and I will talk more about this when we get to blood pressure later next week, but I do want to go ahead and introduce the idea that one of the ways that you can test or look or look for amphosclerosis is by taking a blood pressure. And that has to do with the fact that when you decrease the, the volume that the blood can occupy, you're going to increase the pressure, okay? And that has to do with um, the relationship between volume and pressure, it's an inverse relationship. Less volume for the blood to be able to occupy, basically you're just cramming the blood into a smaller space, that's going to increase the pressure, okay? So we're gonna look later on about how, how you can look for atherosclerosis by taking blood pressure readings. I'll talk about that later. Okay, let's move on to length. Okay, so remember diameter is how fat the blood vessel is. Now we're looking at how long the blood vessel is. So as you increase the length, you're going to decrease the flow. So if you look down here, here we have our blood vessel. The radius stays the same. As you, de as you increase the length, we just make the blood vessel twice as long, what you're seeing is an increase in the resistance. And this is primarily due to the fact that as the blood is flowing through the blood vessel walls, at, it's gonna be in contact with the wall of the blood vessel, and that means it's going to encounter friction. So if you increase the length, you're just making it have more opportunities to encounter friction, and as it encounters that friction, you're going to increase resistance and therefore you're going to decrease the flow. So this would have an inverse relationship. As you increase the length, you're going to decrease the flow. And this picture right here is just showing you what happens in the body. So remember that the left side of the heart pumps to the whole body. That's called the systemic circle, circuit and the right ventricle pumps just to the lungs, which is a much shorter distance because it's right here in the chest next to it. And so because the left ventricle has to pump the entire systemic circuit all the way down to your tippy tippy toes, that's going to be a longer blood vessel. And the longer blood vessel, more friction, more resistance, and therefore you have less of uh, decrease in flow. So to kind of counteract that, the left ventricle has to contract with a lot more force, and, that hap and that's why the walls of the left ventricle are much thicker than the walls of the right ventricle. So I just put this on here just sort of illustrate my point that when you increase the, the length, you're going to increase the, the resistance because of the friction and therefore decrease the flow. Inverse relationship between length and flow. Okay, viscosity. So we've already looked at this in lab, so hopefully this makes sense to you. So viscosity is basically the thickness. Sometimes people talk about it's the resistance to flow, so it may kind of make sense. So think about the difference between pouring syrup and pouring water, right? So or remember in your experiment in lab two where you sucked up the water and then blew it out, nice, quick, and easy. When you suck up the syrup and you blow it out, it takes a lot more force and it goes really slowly, right? So as you increase the thickness, you're going to decrease the flow. So again, it has an inverse relationship. 
Now, your body is not going to change the blood viscosity very regularly. It's not something that's going to be changed. In fact, systems are put into place to try to keep it fairly consistent. So for, you know, you've got your renal system regulating the volume levels, and that's going to help make sure that the blood flow remain, the blood viscosity remains fairly consistent. So, but in extreme cases, for example, if you have extreme dehydration where you just really don't have any more water, what that's going to do is going to make it so that you have less plasma, but the same number of cells. And if you have less plasma, which is the liquid part, the watery part of the blood, less plasma means that the whole, the com composition of the blood is going to be much more viscous because of all those, the same number of cells with less volume. Right, so you would have a dramatic increase in viscosity, and when you increase viscosity, what's going to happen to flow? Increase in viscosity, decrease in flow. Okay, so another example might be anemia. If you have anemia where you are not making red blood cells, if you decrease the amount of red blood cells but you have the same amount of plasma, that would make the blood thinner or less viscous, and when you have a decrease in viscosity, that could have an increase in flow, okay? So, um, please notice at this point, the only variable that really changed very often was the blood vessel radius. Other, the viscosity and the length, they're not gonna change very much because the only way you're really gonna change length is, is with something where you're really drastically changing the, the size of the body. So that would be things like growing up. But by the time you're an adult, it shouldn't change very much. And it only would change if you have uh, obesity or in some cases if you're like really bulking up. But generally the length of the blood vessels is not gonna change. And it definitely is not changing from day to day, right? It'd have to be some drastic change over time. Which leads me to this question right here. Under normal circumstances, which factor does the body have the most control over to adjust blood flow? Right, what, what's, what of these three, length, diameter, or, vis, or viscosity, what's gonna change from moment to moment to regulate blood flow? The answer is diameter or radius. Okay, so you're not really changing your length very often unless you get much, much bigger. And viscosity is not is generally held fairly constant unless there's something extreme such as dehydration or anemia. But your blood vessel diameter, that's changing all the time. Okay, so you have vasoconstriction, vasorelax, vasodilation, and all you have to do is to, to contract or relax the smooth muscle. And so it was going to have a fairly regular change. The other thing I want you to notice is that for the blood vessel diameter, it's an exaggerated effect, four times bigger, okay? So even small, even small increases in radius is gonna have a dramatic increase in the amount of blood flow, okay? So not only is that the easiest to change, it's also the most, uh, emo the biggest effect on the body. Okay, that's all for now. I'll move on to the cardiac cycle in just a second.